tonight we have a discussion about a global warming factor fiction. Uh, I'm going to introduce the team here in a second, invite them to come up, and then they will also um, introduce themselves and tell a little bit about their background. You will see is an entire United States Navy theme here tonight. <laughs> I had nothing to do with that, <laughs> by the way. Um, and our format will be the, uh, they will make the presentations, three separate presentations, and after that wraps up, we will have a Q&A a period. Uh, I will moderate the Q&A, and, and I'll say in the gentlest way I can, uh, when you're asking your questions, I don't have a microphone to go around the floor. I'm going to ask you to stand up and uh, state your question. We'll try to repeat it for everybody else so they can understand it. Um, but also, I'm going to ask you to ask a question. We already have three speakers tonight. Does that make sense? We have three speakers tonight, so uh, please don't plan on giving a speech but ask a question and I will moderate and keep us moving. And then we'll, we'll wrap up uh, pretty close to 8.30. We'd like to wrap up and have us on our way about 8.30. Uh, we are hopefully streaming live to the world right now. And we, this will also be recorded tonight and you'll be able to see it also on Emmanuel Bible website under the Men's Ministry Summer Sunday Series. So our speakers tonight are uh, Jim Smithers, uh, Jim Carlson and Eric Smith. Uh, Trevor Specht has also worked with this team uh, to put their information together. They have practiced and researched over many, many weeks. Uh, so I'm going to step away from the mic and please welcome uh, Jim Smithers, the team leader. Thank you, Tom. Okay, global warming, fact or fiction, and we're gonna answer that. This is our roadmap for tonight. I'm gonna to give the introduction. I will do the second one. How, does this, how did this issue get started? Where is it going? Is man-made CO2 really the cause? Is gonna be Jim Carlson. That's the science part of it. And number four, what does history show? That's gonna be Eric uh, Smith. And then he'll also do the conclusion. This is who we are, and we adapted this slide from uh, uh, Trevor, Eric, and I teach one on evolution, and there's a lot of overlap between this issue and, uh, and evolution. Um, but uh, this is the slide we use. You can see who we are. Uh, the, the brains are mostly the ones that are uh, to the right. You're right, so. Okay, to, uh, as part of the introduction, we want to develop our lens, and this is the lens we're gonna use. We're gonna use a verse from the Bible. And uh, this is uh, Genesis 8:22. This is what God said to himself after the flood. And he said, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. So if you've got a disposition that, uh, you know, the, the, the Bible is authoritative and is true, you would sort of look at that and say, well, there, are, there is going to be times of cold. There's going to be times of heat. Things seem to run on, uh, on cycles. The trains are going to run on time, but I see nothing in here where God uh, is concerned about the earth coming off its axis, coming off the uh, ability to su support mankind. Uh, in fact, he, he loves mankind and he wants human productivity. That's not to say that we, we, don't need to, we do need to be uh, good stewards. We all want that. We want clean air. We want clean water. We want clean food. But we think God provided a, uh, an environment where we can, uh, you know, where it won't become uninhabitable. A little bit more of our uh, lens as we develop it is history. This is Josephus um, about the Tower of Babel. Josephus is, was a Jewish historian, a general captured by the Romans 2,000 years ago, saw the destruction of Jerusalem, and, uh, and so he wrote about something that occurred about 4,000 years ago. He probably had documents we don't have today. And, he, uh, and this is what he says. He says, now the plain in which they first dwelt was called Shinar. God also commanded them to send colonies abroad for the thorough peopling of the earth might cultivate a great part of the earth and enjoy its fruits after a plentiful manner. But they were so ill-instructed they did not obey God. Now it was Nimrod. He persuaded them not to ascribe it to God. He also gradually changed the government to tyranny, seeing no other way of turning men from the fear of God but to bring them into constant dependence upon his power. 
He also said he would be revenged on God for that he would build a tower too high for the waters to be able to reach. So Josephus, not the same authority as the Bible, but has some history in there. And so you can see that there's people ill-instructed. There's a tendency for humanity to centralize power. And you can see, just like Nimrod, a little bit of confusion on climate. He's basically building a tower after the flood occurred. And so it makes you wonder, maybe it was part of his marketing plan. So that was introduction. Uh, then how did this issue get started? I'm gonna do this briefly. Uh, this is a very compressed timeline. I chose 1968. Other people have other timelines, but uh, 1968, the Club of Rome, and you're probably saying, what is the Club of Rome? And that's what I said about two or three months ago. What in the world is that? Bottom line, it's a, it's a think tank that uh, informs policymakers uh, of what they think they should do to manage upcoming world issues. And so 1972, the Club of Rome came out with its first report called The Limits to Growth. It was actually a, a million, uh, millions and millions sold. 1972, there's sort of a handoff between the Club of Rome, United Nations. You can see the United Nations Environmental Program got started in 1972. 1988, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was created. That's basically the UN's science wing that basically interprets climate data for them. You might think that might be a conflict of interest. 1992, Rio, Rio, these might ring a bell, Rio de Janeiro, Agenda 21, that was a framework for implementing uh, climate policy. 1997, Kyoto Protocol, Bush rejects it. 2006, Al Gore, his movie. 2015, the Paris Agreement, and Trump rejects it. I'm gonna run through this timeline real quick, a lot of, with quotes and a little bit expanded information. And I, you know, I found no better way than to communicate what their thinking was, what their intellectual thoughts were, than to, to pull quotes right out of their publications. But Club of Rome, a little bit about it, 1968, started in Bellagio, Italy, at David Rockefeller's estate. There is a lot of affinity between the Rockefellers and the, uh, the United Nations. Uh, if you remember, John D. Rockefeller actually donated the land the UN sits on today. So there's, there's some connection there. These are some of the early members of the Club of Rome. You can, some of your favorite luminaries are there, I'm sure. Um, I'm gonna highlight the two uh, in the lower right, Robert Mueller and Maurice Strong. They, uh, Robert Mueller, not the one in the FBI right now, but uh, Robert Mueller was uh, actually the number two guy at the UN for a very long time. He's passed away now, but very influential, also very uh, spiritual, um, but was more of a uh, one world government spiritual connection. In fact, I tried to understand him. I bought his book. It's called The, uh, the New Genesis. He was trying to reshape it into his, his idea. Maurice Strong was a, uh, actually became in charge of the UN environmental program of the Baha'i faith and uh, also very interested in trying to create a uh, connected world, uh, world religion. A lot of strange fire, we don't have time to go into it with these guys, but a lot of interesting things came from these guys and I think actually fed into, uh, into the education system also. Okay, so here's some quotes. This is from the first book, The Limits to Growth, 1972. Will this be the world that your grandchildren will thank you for? A world where industrial production has sunk to zero, where the population has suffered a catastrophic decline, where the air, sea, and land are polluted beyond redemption, where civilization is a distant memory. So I had to buy these books because I just couldn't trust the internet on some of these things. You can get them for $2 on Amazon. And, uh, and so basically, they made, they used, they, the first books were a lot of computer models. They hired MIT computer modelers and they ran all kinds of models on what was gonna happen to the earth in the next 50 years. By and large, as you look back on it 50 years past, uh, the vast majority of their projections failed um, in multiple books. And, uh, but what doesn't fail is their continual call to, hey, you know, cede your, your, uh, your power and authority to, to the experts because we know, we know better. So, and this is 1976. This is the next uh, uh, couple down the line, Mankind at the Turning Point. Um, and uh, this one says it requires the emergence of a new global economic order worldwide, carefully planned. Such a system cannot be left to the to the mercy or to the narrow mercy of narrow national interests. And uh, and when I look at that, I, I I look at the word planned, and I I think of central planning. I think of Venezuela right now, and uh, usually you know large scale central planning usually ends in tears. I also think of the Pentagon, but that's a different story. So. <laughs> 
Uh, this is from the same book, 1976. This is the same. They're looking at the problem set, and I mean, you know, you almost can't make this stuff up. Uh, and they they said to handle these problems, we we want to regionalize the world into ten different areas and and try and manage it from there. And uh, you know, and, and we're not saying that the UN's ready to take over and and you know, world domination by the UN. If anything, I'd say the UN, the the tide is going out on the UN at least for now. Um, but it does harken back to the Tower of Babel in the sense of humanity's interest in centralizing power and uh, and controlling. And there's many other, you know, there's many other countries that want to do the same thing. Other organizations that want to do the same thing. Other religions that want to do the same thing. They all have a wonderful plan for your life. Um, one of them, uh, and I, I thought it was too humorous. What well, actually I don't know if it's humorous is is the uh, European Union, their Parliament building. They even designed it after the Tower of Babel. So 1991, the common enemy of humanity is man, and searching for a new enemy to unite us, we came up with the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, water shortages, famine, and the like would fit the bill. All these dangers are caused by human intervention. It is only through changed attitudes and behaviors that they can be overcome. The real enemy, then, is humanity itself. I mean, it's almost hard to uh, imagine. That was, uh, that's, uh, that's another one I have, the first global revolution. And uh, right after that, and this is, uh, right after that is, uh, time-wise, is Agenda 21. This is the Rio de Janeiro, and this is where uh, this came out at that conference. And I'll just read what it is. It's a comprehensive plan of action to be taken globally, nationally, and locally by the organizations, the United Nations, the United Nations system, governments, and major groups in every area in which human impacts the environment. And it was, it was designed in many, uh, to cover vast areas of, of human, uh, you know, where, where we are and the space that we operate in. One that I think, uh, that I think they've been very successful in has been in education. Uh, this guy, this is actually fed into our education system, and you can actually see it. This, uh, this right here is just a short video clip of uh, a guy named Brian uh, uh, Sussman who basically goes around to Earth Day events and he, he interviews people and tries to capture their, uh, their interest and in what they say about global, uh, global warming. Individual patterns of reducing consumption. What is the most serious threat facing humanity today? Um, uh, human existence. Wow. How does that make you feel? Um, kind of like, like I wish that they didn't pollute and that it never happened and sometimes I wish we didn't exist. So I, you know, and so, and I'm, I'm sorry to pick on a little girl, but I, I think, you know, that's part of the point is that, uh, you know, if, if our culture and our, our schools and our, our government can press upon us that our, our mission should be to save the planet, I think what gets lost in there is, is that, well, you know what the whole story of history is that, well, we need to be saved. That's the whole point of history. And I think that'll grow strangely dim if, that, if their view becomes, uh, becomes dominant in our school systems. Okay, we're up to 2010 now. One must say clearly that we redistribute de facto the world's wealth by climate policy. One has to free oneself from the illusion that international climate policy is environmental policy. It has nothing to do with environmental policy anymore. This is Ottomar Edendorf. He uh, was the IPCC, that's the UN science wing. And uh, I mean, he's, it's really pretty transparent. Uh, we redistribute de facto the world's wealth. I, I, I said to the guys, I said, you know, this guy certainly must have gotten in trouble for saying this. So I looked him up two weeks ago, and if anything, he's been promoted. He is one of the stars of the, uh, the environmental movement in, uh, in, in the UN and in Europe. And, uh, and then I went a little bit farther and I went into his bio. It's on Wikipedia, you can look it up. And the thing that caught me, I looked at the, the he listed about five people whose writings inspired him and his thinking. And the two that stuck out was, he listed Karl Marx and John Dewey. Karl Marx, of course, Marxism. John Dewey is a creator of the American education system. Uh, you can think social engineering. You can think uh, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. That's basically true. He was sort of right in that. Uh, the problem, I think, with Ottomar is I think he's, uh, he would rather have Karl Marx rock in the cradle. 
2017 ready and waiting. This is where we are today. This came out in April 2017, uh, uh, and uh, I think they were hoping for a different president and a different decision. But uh, uh, what it was, it's, it was basically consortium. Al Gore is the chairman of it. There was banks, companies, investors, UN officials, all on the on the board. I, I read the executive summary. A couple of the lines say carbon tax wedge is essential. Uh, global annual investments at 20 trillion a year. Uh, atomized energy efficiency investments involving decisions by multiple investors, households, and companies. Carbon pricing, anything that costs CO2 into the atmosphere, we're gonna, we gotta charge for it. Atomized means all the way down to the small green molecules in your wallet. Fact or fiction takeaway, closing this up. Fact, their own words make man-made global warming motives suspect. And as a subsidiary one, I would say, uh, you know, be careful of the narratives you buy. Uh, you end up buying narratives, you can, uh, you can end up a long ways from Kansas. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jim Carlson. He'll be doing man-made CO2. Good evening. Uh, I work for a federal research center, uh, have for 26 years now. And I'm not a climatologist, I'm an astronomer, physicist. Um, but one of the things we do there is we do a lot of studies about proposals that have been made to the government to say, can you tell us whether there are holes in this logic? Can you tell us whether there are variables missing, where there's uh, misperceptions of different parts of this? And so that's what I've been doing for 26 years now in all kinds of different uh, venues. And when I saw some of the climate narrative documents coming out, I thought, oh man, there's a couple red flags right there. And so I decided to go ahead and look into them more closely. Uh, this is not uh, sponsored by DOD, my research. This is my own personal research. It's not sponsored by my agency. Uh, but I felt it was important to really try to dig down and, and, and look at some specific things. So that's what I'm going to show you tonight. Uh, first of all, the Obama-era climate narrative. You know, you probably remember the, in, in, the uh, attorney generals saying that they're going to, you know, penalize any company that doesn't agree with the climate narrative and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so how do you define it? Well, I took uh, this report. This is a report by the National Academy of Science that uh, Mr. Obama had put together so he would use it at Paris and that sort of thing. Uh, and the, the eight bullets that you see here on the slide basically summarize the sections in this report. I can't cover all of those. I usually take an hour to cover this when I talk to groups. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on the CO2 question, the sun issue, and what's its role, and then a little bit at the bottom. I did have a bunch of handouts. I think they're all taken back there because I don't see any on the table anymore. But if you didn't get a handout that has more details, uh, I have a, a paper there. I've actually constrained my words in the paper to just three pages <laughs> and a few figures so that it's not too long to read. Uh, and I also have a one-page sheet that talks about these issues and, and things that might be something for you to think about. Uh, if you didn't get one of those, uh, just put your name and your email address down there. It looks like this. There's one page that has red writing and black writing on it, and then there's the three-page paper. So the first thing I, when I looked at some of this material was I saw three major flaws in the narrative that, from my point of view. Uh, first of all, this is a groupthink kind of thing, it seems to me. Groupthink is when you have an assumed answer to some problem, everybody's rushing down the road to get that, to refine that same answer. And so the research that's done basically is, is really good scientific research, and of course there's a tremendous amount of scientific research here on, on the climate change. but but it's focused on the fact that the answer better be blank, blank in the end. And what that causes to happen is you end up ignoring conflicting data that might be there, or you explain away that data very superficially. And uh, two examples of this in my lifetime were the oil depletion uh, prognostications by the whole science community. When I was in graduate school, this was, I was in graduate school in 77 when you had to sit in line for the gas pumps and all that kind of stuff. All the science community was saying there will be no gasoline by 1990, none. 
we're all in agreement. It's just not going to happen. Well, obviously that didn't happen. Uh, the nuclear weapons program in Iraq, you know, uh, agent, you know, I work with the intelligence community. The analysts that did that work worked really hard to get good information. They felt convinced that there was a nuclear program. Of course, Hussein actually said there was a nuclear program. Uh, and we had other sources. But then in the, in the in retrospect, the CIA did a study afterward. We didn't find such a program when we went into Iraq. And, and came up with a whole list of you know, methodologies that the CIA now uses and the whole community uses to make sure they don't fall into a groupthink kind of a situation. But groupthink situations are tricky, so you've got to be careful. And two of the things that came out of that, were, and from my view, is there's key historical climate data that's been ignored. And Eric Smith, that's what he's going to talk about tonight, a lot of that kind of data. And there's also a key sun cycle that was ignored. Uh, it does not show up anywhere in this report. Okay? Uh, and so I'm going to talk to you about that. First of all, uh, I want to talk to you about the greenhouse effect. What is that? I, does everybody here know what that is? I don't know. But the main thing is that we have an Earth, we have a sun, we have an atmosphere around the Earth. The only input of external energy to the Earth is the sun. That's our input. Uh, but along with the, sun, with the sun, we have a process here which is called the greenhouse effect where gases in the atmosphere take radiation that's been brought up from the Earth. Basically, the sun shines on the Earth, warms up the Earth, the Earth gives off infrared radiation, and that radiation is absorbed by some types of molecules. And then when it's re-emitted, those molecules don't like to stay in the energetic state long. They want to get rid of that radiation right away. But it's emitted in all directions. And so the key thing is, is that a lot of this radiation, or half of it, sort of comes down or comes into the atmosphere and not up. And so there's a little cycle here that's creating like a little uh, you know, oven effect here, keeping this much warmer than it would be if there was no atmosphere, no greenhouse gases. But in the end, uh, through the different layers, the, the heat is transmitted upward because there has to be as much Earth radiation out as there is sun radiation in, otherwise we're not in balance. So the question, the big question uh, for global warming that, that kind of comes out of all of this is, we are warming up, most people feel, and I do too. Uh, so the question is, is it because of the sun? Is it because sun changes? Or is it because of changes in the amount of greenhouse gas that has turned up the heat on this little furnace that's running here with the greenhouse effect? Uh, the, the global narrative says, no, the sun is not a factor. It doesn't change enough to make any difference. Uh, and it's CO2, it's, and particularly man-made CO2 has pushed the CO2 levels up, and it's this little furnace that's the cause of the global warming. So if you look at history, you can look back. This is a, a NOAA, and I'm not talking about the NOAA and the ARC. I'm talking about the, the, the agency whose responsibility it is to collect climate types of data and put them together. This is a chart from their database. It's based on ice core data from Greenland. It's about Greenland temperatures in the last 5,000 years. So the very right-hand part of the screen is, is the zero point. That's today. And this is 5,000 years ago on the, the left-hand side. And when you look at this, you see a couple things. You see a cyclical kind of thing where there's warm periods and then colder periods in between. But you also see that it's been pretty warm in the past. Uh, so, so this is something that's been taught for quite a while. It's been around for a while. Uh, in the 1990 IPCC report, it reflected this uh, medieval warm period hump and the, the little ice age. I don't know how many of you in grade school or fifth grade or whatever were talk, told about the little ice age. We've all heard about the little ice age, okay? Well, you know, this was in the IPCC report, but, but by 2001, it was missing. By 2001, it, this is the graph that is used in the report, which shows that you know, the temperature was kind of wiggled around some, but it was pretty level. And then now, just recently in the, in the last century, has shot way up. And of course, this is the kind of graph that gets people all excited and, and stuff like that. Um, basically, there was no medieval warm period left, no little ice age left. And 
since this was shooting up, the question is, okay, how did, why did it shoot up? Well, people were looking at CO2 levels and said, oh, CO2 was fairly level during this whole period of time, which I totally agree with. And it's been going up in the 1900s. And so, ah, it must be the cause. CO2 must be the cause of this big upsurge in temperature. But the question is, what's the whole framework you're making that decision from? Are you making it from a decision, a framework of real historical data? Or are you making it from a, a framework that is not true? So let's, let's keep that in your mind. And this is a chart that I got from a NASA publication called the Earth Observer. Uh, in the early 1990s, I did a number of studies for NASA and, and on uh, their climate monitoring satellites and how to build those uh, pros and cons and things. And so they put me on the distribution list for their periodical. So I get this every two months. It talks about all the different uh, discussions that the folks are having there, and they have panels on different areas you know, of science that they're collecting. Uh, and this one came out in 2011, and it shows uh, Earth temperature as they felt was the most appropriate at that time. And it goes from 1880 over to 2020, or well, it doesn't go to 2020, it stops here at 2011. But you can see temperature jumps up and down according to the data quite a bit, but it has some big trends and they had these mapped out here. About every 30 years there's been a different trend, a, a downtrend here, an uptrend from 2010 up to tw 1940, or I mean 1910 to 1940. Uh, and then back down again a little bit, and then back up, and now during the pause, the quoted pause, it's kind of either going down or it's level around there. Uh, and so they had discussions, that's why these question marks are up here. Why did that happen? They're looking for what are the drivers of this? So it indicates that, that they were not convinced that greenhouse gases were the driver of all this stuff, uh, and they're discussing that. If you take that graph and you put it on a thousand year graph and put it on the right hand side here, and then you take other measured data down to about 1700, you get a climb in earth temperature starting around 1700 up till the present time. Uh, it turns out, luckily, well not luckily, God had it planned, but in, in 1658 is when we, uh, or where the, when people invented, invented the current modern thermometer. Uh, and so the Fahrenheit scale came in to standardize things about uh, 1724. And so there's been some good thermometer readings and good you know, tracking of, of data from that time on. So where did I get this stuff back here? I got that from my own investigation of cultural information that's out there about the climate. What was the climate like? And of course, Eric is going to talk all about that. There was According to that, a really warm period here when the Vikings were off settling and farming in Greenland. Uh, there was a very cold little ice age when the ice froze so thick in, in the Thames and, and the Seine rivers that, that people took their horses and buggies out on the river in the wintertime and had fairs out there. Big changes in temperature. Uh, and so, in a sense, I could use the ice in the rivers in Europe as a thermometer of my own based on that. In any event, what does this show? This shows there is sort of a thousand year cycle, just like that Greenland data shows. There's a thousand year cycle, warm, colder, warm again. And the hockey stick, well, that's one of the fictions in the, in the process. So if you look at the narrative points one and two about warming, yes, the earth is warming. You know, don't deny warming. I think it's pretty solidly established. It's been warming for about 300 years. But it's not unusual. We've done this a lot of times throughout history. There's this thousand year cycle that goes on. Uh, one of the interesting things is the narrative basically hardly ever discusses the last thousand years. Every graph you see is either of the last 20, 30 years, maybe 50 years, or it's of the last 400 million years. They don't show any in between <laughs> because they'd have to deal with this cycle. Uh, so anyhow, Often the, the Earth has been warmer than today, uh, but everybody, both the history science and the climate narrative you know, folks, all agree that the solar changes is what drove everything before the Industrial Age. And they usually set the Industrial Age at about 1910, the start of the Industrial Age where a lot of carbon dioxide was being produced and that sort of thing. Uh, so the question is, what is the sun's you know, current contribution? This is a graph from the University of Colorado. They have a, an atmospheric center there, and you can look it up. 
Uh, if you picked up my paper or I send it to you, I've got the website there that you can look this up. But in any event, it basically shows that since the early 1700s, the amount of radiation coming into the Earth has been increasing. This is watts per square centimeter hitting the Earth over here as a scale, and these are years through the current time. So yes, the sun did change during this period, and it changed in a way that you can see there's a bunch of spikes here. Uh, it turns out that the, the sun sort of has a natural rhythm where it puts out a lot of radiation for a couple years and it quiets down a little bit, so you see these spikes. And that rhythm actually corresponds to what's known as sunspot cycles because long before we had tabulated data like this, astronomers saw spots on the sun and they didn't know what in the world they were, but they kept track of them. And the Chinese, 2,000 years ago, have records of the sunspots and the sunspot cycles and what's going on. And so when you look at these two places right here, the Dalton minimum, the Maunder minimum, these are named after astronomers who declared that that was a minimum in the number of sunspots. But those two minimums actually coincide with real recordings that we have recently. So what can you do? You can take this graph, put it in parallel with the temperature one. Here's your solar graph on the bottom, and this is the graph I just showed you over here. And you can take those sunspot uh, historical data and fare in you know, what you think is a likely graph for solar stuff. And you find out, yes, it's that same cycle. It's the thousand year cycle. And matter of fact, if you look at these two side by side, you can see a lot of correlations. If you put those two right beside each other, this is the temperature on the top, this is the solar on the bottom, and you compare those two, you can also come up with some interesting things. So what I did is, of course, there's this before industrial age, after industrial age kind of question. I took the change in solar intensity before the industrial age, which is up to 1912, and saw what the proportion is, and then I looked above 1912. Now one thing before I get off this graph, you'll notice that, that in the solar world, these uh, are starting to roll off a little bit. So the sun has quieted down a little bit lower in intensity in the last 20 years, okay? But if you take those points I just talked to you about, you have a certain amount of solar intensity and a certain amount of temperature that was true for that, and you have a relationship between those two. If you take from, now, from then until now, that relationship is exactly the same relationship. That tells me that this temperature that we've looked at in the 1900s is probably almost all due to the sun. There's not even any room here for anything else. Now, I'm sure there's some other things in there and there's some slop in the math and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, the, the narrative folks need to look at this. This is one of the things that I'd like them to look at. If you look at CO2, in your mind, if I was to ask you what percentage CO2 increase was there between 1900 and 1998, what would you say? I mean, don't yell out. Put it in your mind. What, what percentage do you think CO2 went up? You've all seen Al Gore's movie with it going up and up and up and up, right? Well, I'll show you in just a second. It went up 20%. CO2 increased 20% between 1910 and 1998, and that's the big upsurge in temperature that everybody talks about. And they talk about, you know, it's, it's parts per million, 300 parts per million up to 400 parts per million. Big numbers, sounds like a big deal. But can you think of a million dots in your head? <laughs> Probably not. Can you think of 10,000 dots? Can you look at the wall up here and say, okay, I can think of 100 here and I'm maybe make 1,000, 10 of those is 10,000. If you look at the uh, atmosphere out of Every 10,000 molecules in the atmosphere, in 1900, there were three CO2 molecules. In 1998, at the height of the temperature, there were 3.6 CO2 molecules, okay? So there's one molecule increase out of 20,000 parts of the atmosphere of CO2 during that time. Doesn't sound like a big mover to me. Meanwhile, when you're looking at the greenhouse effect and you take the water vapor plus the cloud effects, that basically is 95% of the greenhouse effect. That's what's running that little engine down there. 
because uh, water vapor is 50, or 100, uh, 10 to 50 times more in concentration than CO2. So what does that say? Basically, CO2 in the bottom line is a trace gas. Anything that's less than a thousandth of the atmosphere is called a trace gas. And the percent of uh, that's man-made CO2 is not even defined, but it's much less than that. So the bottom line is, to me, it looks like you know, water vapor and so forth drives the greenhouse effect and the man-made CO2 contribution is likely to be very small and probably not even noticeable. It'll get lost in the noise. You know how much, no how much difference there is in humidity from day to day? Okay, so what does the historical plot of CO2 show? This is that temperature plot that I showed you. This is just the main bars of the changes. CO2 was fairly level around 300 for most of this time, started creeping up, creeping up by 1960. By 1980, it was up to 363. And then it's been increasingly uh, going up. So you see this curve. So CO2 is, is accelerating in its increase. It doesn't really match any of these time scales here as far as really looking like it's a driver. Up here it should be a driver because it's the steepest it's ever been, but what's happening? The temperature is actually pausing and coming down. So what does that tell you? Well, it's not the CO2 that's driving that temperature. So here's, here's a, a picture of models. The, the climate models that are in existence now are all you know, based on this CO2 hypothesis. This is what they predict as the temperature increase that should happen from 2000 and beyond. This down here in the red and blue, that's what really happened. Okay, so this is the pause. This is where things are pretty level. And one of the things they did on this chart, they didn't include 1998. It's a big spike over here on the left. So when you look at the spike on the left, it looks like things are going down. So the bottom line, what's the comparison of CO2 and the solar? I'm not gonna read all this to you. Uh, but one of the key things is, it's interesting that in, 19, in, in 2017, uh, there have been two new reports that came out just at the beginning of the year. The Swiss National Science Foundation wrote a report, says, the sun's impact on climate change quantified for the first time. For the first time? You didn't think about this until now? But the Science Foundation has charts that look just like the ones I showed you, okay? In Germany, two of the top German climate scientists came out and said, the sun drives the climate in Spain and Portugal because they did the same type of analysis. They analyzed the solar data on the bottom, they compared it to the temperature data that they had for those, those countries. And so you're seeing more and more people come out basically saying the same thing. And of course, as more data comes out like this, you're gonna see a lot of reactions to that. You probably have seen on the internet, there's crazy stories out there I saw the last couple of days about how we're all gonna burn up in at least two years from now, or <clears throat> all kind of stuff. So, as Jim said, be aware of what you, what you focus on. Two quick points and I'll be off here. Uh, the, don't let people tell you that 97% of all scientists agree. Basically, that was a survey that was taken where only a tenth of the people at a conference responded to the survey, the real diehards, and of the real diehards, only 97% agreed with the narrative. Basically, 39% of meteorologists are the only ones that supported the narrative in a climate uh, survey that the American Meteorological Society just did a couple years ago. Very few astronomers agree, very few, or many climatologists don't agree. And there's actually a partition out there that 31,000 plus scientists have signed saying the narrative's got problems. So the bottom line is regulation of CO2 needed. I, don't, I think it is not needed. It doesn't appear to be a big driver and it's certainly not needed if the economic impacts of doing it are, are detrimental. And so the bottom line is uh, President Trump's withdrawal from the Paris Agreement I would totally agree with. Two things I would include for the administration to do is one, do a reassessment of climate science and let all the people all these scientists be able to come in and show their data and have an open forum instead of the current process that's going on. And then protect those scientists. Scientists need protection right now if they don't agree with the narrative because if that comes out, they're fired or there's, there's bad things that happen to them in a lot of different areas. And 
Uh, they're aware of that. I've seen it in the literature a lot, so that needs to happen too. So the bottom line, yes, the Earth's warming up. Yes, we should expect some climate change because the sun is warming us up. But no, it's not due to CO2. And we really can't do anything to stop the change, so we better prepare for the change. So our focus should go from trying to stop the change, which I don't think is going to happen, and prepare for it. Now, on the other hand, I showed you that little dip in the, in the, the sun's output. Well, we may be at the top. <laughs> we may be rolling back down the, the cooling ladder. Here, who knows? The thing to do is watch the sun's output. Don't watch CO2 levels. Okay, so now I'm going to turn it over to Eric Smith for some history that backs up this uh, periodicity. Thank you, Jims. Um, hi, I'm Eric Smith. Some of you may recognize me as a tenor in the choir. <laughs> I'm a mathematician with a background in physics, but tonight I'm going to talk to you about history. Um, and we're going to go through about 2,000 years of history in the time we have left, so buckle up your seatbelts because we're going fast. Um, I do want to show this. This is from an, another study showing the plots of what we're going to look at is actually the um, Roman Warm Period, the Dark Age Cold Period, the Medieval Warm Period, and the, you see this period where it's decreasing here. Um, that's known as medieval glaciation a bit, then followed by the little ice age, and then you can see at the end it's, we're back in the modern warm period. Um, what you see in this study here, the, the red is act, was actual thermometer temperature data um, because the thermometers weren't around before that. The black line is uh, the mean averages of uh, the different ways that they would try to approximate the data from different scientific methods and um, and that the gray line for anybody who knows stats, that's two standard devi deviations. Um, basically what you need to take out of it from this is that if you apply the same methods that they use to measure temperatures before thermometers existed, like what, what we looking back into the past are doing, if you use those same methods, it was actually warmer during the medieval warm period than it is today, even though the thermometer says it's warmer today. Um, these approx the, the, approx the approximate data disagrees with what the actual one is, but if you, so... Yeah, keep that in mind. So we're starting out with the Roman Warm Period uh, anecdotes. Um, before this time, the uh, Tiber River there, it was known to actually frequently freeze, and snow would stay on the ground in Italy for long periods of time, but then they started not seeing that, the Romans would notice. In fact, after 100 BC, they started writing, well, the uh, grapes and olives are not growing um, as north in Italy as they used to, and so they just kind of noticed that. Um, in the year 139, the River Thames actually was just dried up for two days, solid. So there was, there was a drought going on in England at that time. But overall, this was a very nice time to live. Um, it, it just the, the climate was very stable during this time, and it allowed the, the Romans to expand. And this was actually the time period called the Pax Romana, if you remember that from your history classes, when the, uh, it was just a time of relative peace. There weren't any major wars breaking out because... Most people were happy um, at the time. <laughs> you know of a few who weren't. Uh, next, we're moving into the, the Dark Age Cold Period. And as you can see, when I introduce these, you can look in the timeline there to see about the time we're doing. Now, you may wonder, what's this boat doing in the Dark Ages? Well, um, this was actually a picture of the harbor of Venice in the year 2012. You don't think of it, a lot of ice in the water in Italy, but it does happen. And it, it, every once in a while, it happened in the year 2012 here. Where, um, and, but you can see th there was ice there, but the boats could still navigate. That's important. Remember that. Uh, going down the timeline, um, when they started getting into this period, uh, in the year 271, and I know it's a little hard to read on the map, but snow covered the square of Rome to a height of several feet for 40 days in Rome. From the year, um, uh, in the 300s, there was actually no rain that fell at all in, in Cyprus for 36 years, and the entire island was abandoned. A, different, a lot of climactic instability going on here. In both the years 301 and 401, it's reported that the Black Sea completely froze over. Um, in, in fact, in 401, it was re reported that you could walk from Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, north to the Crimean Peninsula, right across the entire sea. To get, put that into perspective, today, 
when um, only the very northwest part of the Black Sea will freeze during the winter, and that's only in, during the really, really bad winters. The rest of the time, it's ice-free. Um, so this was something radical going on with the climate during this time. That same year in 401, the Thames River froze solid for two months. Uh, later on, a, in the year, the winter of 764, the north 100 miles or so of the Black Sea froze over that year, but it froze to the depth of around 30 cubits. Now, a cubit is the length from a man's elbow to the tip of his middle finger. Um, if you ever see that in the Bible and you hadn't, didn't know it. Um, the Dardanelles could also be tra traversed by foot that winter. The Dardanelles were one of those straits that connect the Black Sea to the Mediterranean. Um, in the year 829, the Nile River froze over. over. They are in Egypt. Yes. Um, in the year 860, it was a very, very severe winter. Most of the rivers in Europe actually froze solid for two months, um, and some for their entire length, like the Rhone River. The Adriatic Sea actually froze to the extent that carriages were used on it, and people went to Venice on horseback over the frozen water. Now, you see the frozen water in the background there, but there's a boat on it. You couldn't ride a horse and carriage on that. But they could in the year 860, that winter. In fact, the port of Venice was frozen solid, and at least part of the Mediterranean Sea was frozen that winter. And um, it was passable by carts in the year 860, and the Ionian Sea froze. The Ionian Sea, if you think of it, the, Italy, the boot, it, it's the part down below the boot. That was frozen. After the Dark Age cold period, things started warming up again, and we get to what's called the Medieval Warm Period. During this time, we know from records that vineyards existed 500 kilometers north of their 20th century limits because the climate was better, it was warmer, they could grow up there. In fact, um, in Germany, grapes could grow, were growing up to 720 feet higher in elevation than they do today. Uh, wheat and oats were actually grown in the Trondheim, Norway, about the middle of the country here. That suggested the climates were about one degree Celsius warmer there than the present. And we also know that citrus trees were grown further north in China than they can grow today, just from the historical records. By about uh, the year 870, the Vikings had taken all of England except for Wessex, which is the bottom here. They knew things were good, it was warm, so they could go out and explore. Um, after they did that, they kind of conquered all over the place. This is the total extent of where they went, you'll see. And they went, they eventually, what we're going to focus on is they went to Iceland, and then later Greenland. They are, Iceland was established as an independent country in the year 930. Now, from Iceland, they started going over to Greenland, because the, I, there, it was a clear sea route from Iceland to Greenland. They could just go straight west and not run into any ice. Um, but during this time period, we know in the Alps, there were two important glaciers there, the Aletsch and the Grindelwald glaciers in Switzerland. They were actually much smaller than they are today. We're going to see those glaciers in a bit. Um, in the year 1022, uh, there was a heat wave in Europe that was so severe that it was reported that marble and plaster sweat profusely. Um, you could think of just, you take really hot, hot temperatures, really high humidity, and the condensation on these would look, make it look like they were sweating. And the way it was described, it's like it was just the water was just running down these. Um, but that same year, it, just to make sure that you know, it wasn't just in Europe, there was a it, very bad famine in India that it completely, completely depopulated many of the provinces over there. Um, around the 1100 is when the human population of Iceland reached its peak. And this is actually, I want to look at a closer look here at what the Vikings did when they were going across here. You can see they went from their homelands over here and conquered most of the um, British Isles, and they went over and settled Iceland. From there, they just went due west to Greenland because they could. There was no ice in the way, and they established two colonies over here, what's called the Western and the Eastern Settlement. And then from there, they went exploring. They went up here because they, uh, there was no ice where there is today. This is a very ice-filled channel up there. You couldn't navigate it very easily by boats nowadays, but they could then. And then they went back over here and went into North America, and who knows exactly how far they got in North America. We know they were at least right here in what's modern-day Newfoundland. Um, later on during this time, I found another record of the River Thames that almost completely dried up in the year 1114. In fact, the channel was only knee-deep under the London Bridge in that year. Mm -hmm. um, in 1116, strawberries were actually still growing in Christmas time. Yeah. Um, and that was in Liege, Belgium. So they had strawberries for Christmas. Um, 
in Greenland, they reached their peak around in the 1100s population, and their diet there consisted maybe mainly of crops and then livestock because there was no permafrost in Greenland, which, as you know, is not very green. Yeah. <laughs> um, and what I found was funny is that in 1125, they obtained their own Catholic bishop there, and they got him by trading him for a live polar bear. <laughs> <laughs> Um, now, I do want to point out, lest we be accused of handpicking data, there were some harsh winters during this time. Um, in fact, uh, you'll see throughout history some very harsh winters happen whenever there's a volcano that erupts somewhere. And like what happened in probably around the year 993, there was a volcano around the border of North Korea and China, and it caused some pretty strange effects that year. Um, in fact, at the end of July, the wa in Germany, the water in the lakes was frozen, and it froze so hard that the fish died. Um, frosts were also recorded then in France, but then the rest of the summer was extremely hot until the cold came again on October 14th and lasted until mid-April, the frost did. Um, and then it lasted again and more until July in the year 995, followed by another heat wave. Um, and later on, and about a couple hundred years later, the Po River there in Italy actually froze from the town of Cremona to the, all the way to the sea. And the Rhone River also froze. Trees burst that over France and northern Italy that year because the sap was freezing inside them. So there were a few harsh winters during this medieval warm period, but overall, the period, it was much warmer than today. That's the important to look at overall. Um, looking elsewhere around the world, this was happening. In the Mayan civilization, um, they started collapsing due to prolonged droughts in there. Um, uh, this happened over a period of successive years. And we know in North America, they were able to date the trees from radiocarbon methods and found out that trees grew during this time period far north than they, uh, northern, more north than they can today. So it was warmer and nicer. And it was also a warmer and wetter climate in the, the Lulang Mountains of north central China than we have today, from just the records. The, the Chinese records you mostly looked at were according to the droughts and floods and things like that, but we also have some records of general temperatures. Um, the Mayans finally collapsed in the year 910 because of drought, but what's interesting I found is that a little bit later, um, further south in there in Nicaragua, there's data they would find these ostracods with little crustaceans. They were living in a lake, and scientists would measure them and, and um, things in them and see that it was actually seemed to be wetter than during this time. Um, so it, it, the climate was not the same around the world, but there were changes that happened. Um, China had droughts and then followed by decades of flooding, too. Um, elsewhere in North America, there was a severe droughts in the Great Plains um, here. Um, there was a worldwide famine in the year 1051 with the, because of the heat um, and, and all over the world. Um, in fact, during this time period, there were several winters where no snowfall was recorded at all in, in China. Now, what you start to see at the end here, in the year, in the 1000s, the Tyndall Glacier up on Mount Kenya bega it actually began to advance. The Tyndall Glacier, um, like I said, is on Mount Kenya. It's the second highest mountain in Africa, and it's actually right there on the equator almost. But there is a glacier on top of it, and it's still there today. It started advancing in the 1000s, which leads us into a period we call medieval glaciation. This is when things started going down, as you see in the timeline here. So around the 1200s, the sea ice was starting to increase around the coastal waters of Iceland. And um, the glaciers there also began to advance, and they started just, they couldn't find any more wood for boat building. Um, later, we see that the glaciers began to advance in several parts of Europe, and in 1215, a irrigation canal was actually overrun by the advance of the Aletsch Glacier, which you see in the background there. It's the, and the head of that canal is still buried today by the glacier. It hasn't gotten back to the point where it was back in the medieval times. Um, in the year 1227, there was thick sea ice in the Baltic, and it allowed a German army to march from the mainland of Estonia to actually capture the islands of Muhu and Sarema, as you see on the map right here. There were bad storms along this period. It destroyed 60 different Danish coastal cities in what's now the very northern part of Germany. Um, so there was lots of instability. In um, the year 1275 was when the initial expansion of the perennial snow and ice cover happened on Baffin Island, which um, is one of those islands north of Canada, and it killed and buried vegetation. It's just now beginning to emerge there. And in the year 1280, the, there was wood that was, uh, that's been dated that was 
buried, a forest buried by that glacier, and the forest at the Grindelwald Glacier, which still does not grow at that site today. So in the, in the 1300s, the vineyards started um, declining in Germany. They completely disappeared from England, where they were, grapes were grown previously. And fishing replaced cereal crops as the main food resource in Iceland, as you, um, it's kind of known there today, fishing. The 1310s were what's known as the Great Famine. There was crop failure and mass starvation all over Europe due to the weather. Um, and generally alone, a third of the population starved to death during that decade. And by the mid-1300s, they couldn't get exactly to Greenland from Iceland anymore because the route was impassable. And they started just, the Vikings started abandoning the settlements in Greenland during the mid-1300s. Um, their last bishop died in 1378. He wasn't replaced. And the last reliable account of the Vikings living there was in 1408. After that, all contact was ended. Elsewhere in the world that was, which was going on, there was more climatic instability. Like in the southwestern U.S., there was a drought that seems to be what caused the disappearance of the Anasazi culture. What you got to see in the picture there is Mesa Verde National Park, if you've, anybody's ever been there. The Anasazi culture built that. And elsewhere, just to get Oceania into the mix, there was a drying trend in Palau during this time. Palau was just north of Papua New Guinea. So now we get into the real thick of it, the Little Ice Age. What you see in the picture here is the 1684 frost fair on the Thames. These frost fairs is when the river would freeze over and they'd go out and have a party on, the, on it. Uh, one year they even brought an elephant there. So you had an elephant walking around in the middle of the river. Um, it, it was a fun time that they would have. During the Little Ice Age, the glaciers started advancing remarkably. Um, gold mines, um, were start, a gold mine started getting blocked by glacier ice in Austria. Um, the Grindelwald Glacier, which you see in the background of this picture here, broke through its in moraine. Its moraine was the very maximum limit it had during the real ice age, which you might have seen slides of at the beginning, uh, during the ice cream. And all the glaciers were um, advancing during this time. In 1595, the Gitros Glacier in Switzerland advanced, it dammed a river, and then 70 people died from the flooding it caused. And it did this again in the year 1818 due to an eruption in Indonesia of a volcano. This drawing is from that year. Um, and I want to show a picture of this. What you see on the left here is another drawing from the year. And what you see on the right is the modern day lake that's dammed by a human dam. It's actually, um, uh, the lake there is, from what I could r tell, it's 198 meters deeper than the lake on the left. So that should tell you what the extent of the ice was. It went way down there. In 1600, the Vernacht Glacier in the Eastern Alps advanced and it blocked the Oropenthal, causing the uh, lake to form, and then the, lake, the ice dam eventually broke apart, causing very destructive flooding. And you see flooding all over the place during this little ice age, because the ice would build up in the winter and then break apart, and you, the flooding would result. We see that out west a lot with, um, when it happens in the springtime. So later in the 1600s, the western coast of Greenland actually began to submerge because the ice on it got so, um, was so thick and heavy, it caused the entire island to start sinking there in the west. And in 1644, the Chamonix glaciers, uh, also known as the Mer de Glace, advanced across the Chamonix Valley, which you see in the background here. It threatened to turn that valley into a lake. Now you can't see the glacier. It was on the left side here of the picture. Um, but I couldn't find a good picture of it, but I wanted to show, the, show you the valley. And the 1644 is around then when they got to their maximum uh, during that time. Yeah. Um, there was a few years where the Seine River completely froze over in December, and I want to point out in 1683, the English Channel froze over that, that winter. Um, the, gla the glacier started then to withdraw in the Alps, but then in Norway, they, they were growing. Um, as we see here, this is a picture of the Nygardsbreen ice cave in Norway. It's underneath the glacier that you can see there. During the, um, this time period, the, this glacier was actually, for 25 years, it would advance at 100 meters a year. You think of glaciers going very slowly. That's not slow. Huh? Um, it was not at the glacial pace. Um, and, but then the, Alps, the glaciers in the Alps started advancing again. And... Um, Basically, the, around the mid-1700s is when the Norwegian glaciers got to their maximum. You might be wondering what was going on in the eastern U.S. during this time, since that's where we are. Well, in 1747 and 1748, New England experienced 30 snowstorms that winter. 
um, in the year 1780, the New York Harbor froze over for the first recorded time. People could walk from Manhattan Island to Staten Island. And not just walk, the British would drag their cannons um, across the ice there to try to fend off any American invasion that never actually happened that year. But they were prepared. Um, and it was the conditions were so they could do this, it lasted for five weeks. Um, that year, the Chesapeake Bay was frozen solid from its head to the mouth of the Potomac, and loaded wagons could pass from Annapolis to Kent Island. That is where the Bay Bridge is today. You could just pass right there on the water. And the ice on the James River that year was 38 inches thick. I couldn't find what part of the James that was, but I thought that was pretty notable. In the year 1783, there was, that was a very, very strange year, and I don't have time to get into all of it. But one of the things that happened that year was there was huge fissure eruptions of the Lockheed Volcano System in Iceland. Sulfur dioxide killed the vegetation, and which, that severe winter um, it resulted in mass starvation. About a fourth of Iceland, Iceland's population died that time. That year, the Mississippi River froze in New Orleans. There were ice flows in the Gulf of Mexico that year. In the area around Paris, the ground was frozen to a depth of 2.1 feet. And all the French rivers there froze. In fact, um, you get a couple of decades later, in the 1810s, that was the coldest decade of the last 1,250 years in the French Alps. Um, the mean summer temperature was 3 degrees Celsius lower than the warmest decades, being in the 1810s and the 1990s. And the very last of these London frost fairs happened in 1814, um, when it was th th still thick enough for them to have it. That was the third. That January was the third coldest month since they had started recording temperatures to a somewhat reliable method in 1659. Um, 1812 to 1813 was another harsh year. The Adriatic Sea at Venice froze again that year. The Sea of Marmora and the Hellespont and the Dardanelles were blocked with ice. Those are the connecting points for, again from the Black Sea to the Mediterranean. The Tiber River was coated, and the Straits of Messina at the eastern tip of Sicily were covered with ice. This is the year, um, well, snow fell over all of North Africa, and drift ice was in the Nile, and this was the when Napoleon thought it'd be a good idea to invade Russia. He lost 400,000 men that year. Um, the mercury in the thermometers in some of his troop, that some of his troops had actually froze. Yeah. Um, there were severe famines in Pakistan and India around this time, and a severe drought in Australia. Can't leave them out of things. Uh, 1816 was the coldest single year on record in many places in Europe and North America, following the eruption of Mount Tambora in Indonesia. Um, glaciers were surging again throughout Europe in the 1810s. They stopped just short of where their maximum was the pre in the 17th century. Um, in North America, it's interesting, this is when the worst of it hit in western North America. The Aba Athabasca Glacier, which is in Alberta, it's northwest of the city of Calgary, it advanced to near its Little Ice Age maximum, completely blocking the valley there, and other glaciers in Canada um, were expanding during this time, and there are several glaciers in Iceland, which I'm not going to pronounce, that reached their maximum historical limit. So this historical info, I wanted to get, shout out the credits. A lot of this came from um, a, a retired professor emeritus at Emporia State University, um, James, Dr. James Aber, and he, uh, another uh, source was uh, this guy named James R. Marisek. He's a retired nuclear guy from the Navy, and he, uh, he's got a cool website, breadandbutterscience.com. Yeah, um, some of the stuff, you know, but what he has on there is he collected all the weather reports he could find from the last 2,000 years. Um, up until, it, well, modern weather reports started happening. So there's a lot of neat info on that site. So to wrap this part of the talk up, global warming fact or fiction, the fact is that the IPCC reports in recent years have completely ignored these well-known climate fluctuations claiming that the present warming is unprecedented. So a better question, I think, instead of global warming fact or fiction might be man-made global warming fact or fiction. That would be fiction, on any, at least on any appreciable level. Now, the final takeaways for, uh, to, to summarize all three of us is the international climate policies such as the Paris Accord have very little to do with the environment, despite what they say. They all have ulterior motives that are very antithetical to a biblical worldview. And warming is currently happening, but it's nothing that hasn't happened before, and it's not nearly as severe as commonly reported. We're not all going to die. Um... Carbon dioxide is also not a major driving force in global warming, uh, and the, the sun, right here, does far more to drive the, the changes in climate than CO2 could ever dream of. And climate is never constant. 
There are periods of warming and periods of cooling. But that's how God designed things. From, um, you, you hear alternative facts that will deny this. They can be descri- described as anti-science, I think. So, just like we started, I think it's best to end in Scripture. So we get back to Genesis 8.22. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. Thank you. Well, these guys have presented quite a bit tonight, but we want to open the floor to some questions. I'll try to be the moderator. So if you have a question, we don't have a microphone. So do us a favor and stand and shout out your question. And hopefully we'll repeat it for uh, the video. Yes, sir. Nice and loud. Okay, I think we got it. So how do we measure temperatures uh, to be standard so we're not measuring high or low to be able to get something that's measurable and actually we can work from? Well, up until, of course, the modern era, the idea was you take a lot of temperature, a lot of thermometers all over the place, and then you lump them all together and average them. Uh, the University of East Anglia runs at a database of that, and they did get a little bit of a trouble uh, in the middle of the 2000s when, when their database kind of got out of hand. Uh, they reduced the number of points that they used. Uh, but then luckily, you know, of course, science came along with satellites, and, and in my view, I, the key here is, is good satellite data. Now, satellites, of course, are collecting data all the way around in their orbit, uh, you can average that pretty well. The only thing you have to stay away from is uh, skewing the satellite data. And that's been actually a problem uh, recently, and hopefully we'll get that cleared up. Another question. Right here. Nice and loud. Yeah, um, I understand. Are satellites the only data, the temperature data that you're collecting or that's being like looked at? Or I understand there's like weather balloon data, but is there is there other... Is there other data sets, or how many data sets are being collected and, uh, you know, sifted through, or is there, you know, feedback data? That okay, so the question is, are we only gathering uh, satellite data, the weather balloons? What are, what are the inputs that we're taking for uh, temperature gradients? Is that correct? Okay. Yes, we, we are gathering ground-based thermometer data. That's most of the East Anglia database. We're also gathering balloon data, sounding rocket data, uh, and of course, the satellite data. Uh, there are a number of different data sets there, and East Anglia tries to pull that in in the appropriate way and blend it all together in their product. Another question. Yes, sir. Nice and loud. Oh, thank you very much. How does the, the narrative be distributed well? I just Repeat that, Nigel. How does the uh, global warming narrative redistribute gl- global wealth? The next question. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's through taxes. And uh, it's just sort of like uh, President Trump alluded to. We were going to have to contribute into a greed fund, and they were going to take it and redistribute it. And that's... And basically the way they're going to redistribute it is the producing nations that were producing uh, carbon dioxide would have to pay the the nations not producing carbon dioxide basically to compensate and that was this that was the idea and there was a whole payment structure you know designed there and so I think it was the right thing for President Trump to pull away from that because the United States was going to have to pay inappropriately uh, in that situation yes, sir uh, Different, uh, 
Okay, so the question really is uh, over the years, maybe even centuries, as the, as the environment has changed, concrete, um, how do we adapt to the difference in maybe the temperatures that are coming that we're gathering? Is that correct, Ed? Okay, good. You know, NOAA does try to compensate for that. They have compensation rules that they use, but it's very spotty, unfortunately, because there's lots of thermometers out there and not that good a knowledge of exactly where all of them are. So that probably has a lot, a lot of catching up to do yet. Uh, you've all heard of the, well, heat island effect sort of. It's always uh, colder out in the suburbs in Manassas by like 10 degrees than it is in DC. And that's because of this heat island, because of the concrete. So that is a real issue. Yeah, I do want to add too that people had studied this when all this the hist main hysteria was during the 2000s, and they people would go out and look and see where these thermometers were in the ground and find that there might have been an open space when the thermometers were first there, but then buildings were built there, and like the thermometers right where an air conditioner exhaust was. Well, yeah, that's going to show warming, uh, and so they had to try to filter out a lot of the, those data points out. Obviously, there was a question over here. Yes. So the question is, if you didn't hear, what should we be doing then to prepare for this fluctuation in temperature? Well, I don't have a whole list of things to do, but, but I think the, th the first step is to focus people on that problem. You can focus your scientists on that problem that are off doing something else now, and I'm sure they would come up with a lot of good ideas. I mean, obviously what you can do is, in coastal areas, if you think that the water is going to end up rising, you start working now to, to bolster that up. You, you have a lot of money for that. You do things like that that, that will accommodate you know, the, the types of changes you think are going to come. And I would add we would eat more ice cream. So there was one other question right here, and then we'll take one more. We have time for one more question. So how do you explain the difference between the, the uh, predicted modeling and the actual temperatures? Is that what you're asking? Well, okay. I know how I would explain it. I mean, basically their models are incorrect. Their, their theory is incorrect. How they explain it, they, fact, they actually have written in print, we're still very confident that the temperatures are gonna rise like we predicted. We're just waiting for it to happen. Okay, and the last question. Got one in the back there. My question they reported that the temperature from about 1880 to the present has increased by eight tenths of a degree Celsius. But the real question is then, as you've shown through these various slides, that the temperature has gone up and down. So to summarize your question, uh, of all the models and the fluctuations we've seen, what should be the ideal temperature? Is there an ideal temperature? Okay, thanks, David. Okay. Yeah, the only thing, the only thing I've seen on that actually is a report that said it would, might be good to be a degree or two warmer than we are right now uh, for agricultural reasons, and you'd have a better crop output and all that sort of thing. Uh, I don't know whether people agree with that or not, but, but that's the only one I've seen. And uh, if you look at the records, the, all the, in history, the best years of the expansion of civilizations and whatnot happened during the warm periods. You have the, the Roman warm period. Before that, there was um, the Minoan around that time when the cultures were really just exploding. And um, then, the, so it, it seems like it would be a better time because less people, cold can kill a lot of people, but heat doesn't, there's ways to survive heat easier than if the temperatures drop too much. But 
Yeah. Well, good. Well, we need to wrap up. We promised you we would wrap up at 8.30. Will you please thank these three men for the work that they've done? And I want to thank you, each of you, for coming tonight. Uh, I hope this has helped uh, sharpen your focus a little bit. Uh, I love that we ended with scripture, and we're going to close in prayer as well. So will you join me? Father, I thank you for uh, who you are again in our lives, for the fact that you are the one that created this earth. You put it into existence. Uh, you developed the weather patterns. You developed everything. You know when it's going to end. And God, that we would rise above all that's going on and just trust you. And that we live as men and women in this world with a desire for spiritual impact and desire to share truth. And so, Lord, anything we walk away from tonight focuses back to you and your creation and that you control the universe and help us to understand that more clearly from what we've heard tonight. I uh, thank you again, God, for our gathering. Uh, thank you that you love us. I uh, thank you that you send your son to die for us. We'll be eternally grateful. And we leave tonight with that in our hearts and minds. And we pray this tonight in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. <laughs>